Hello, and welcome to the first episode of my new series, Project Bluebird. Having learned so much from Project T80, I thought it'd be a good idea to make something along the same lines, but a little bit more complicated. The T80 project has taught me a lot. I've discovered how to recreate the complex three-dimensional curves that make up the car's bodywork in my 3D modelling software. I've also discovered some useful techniques for 3D printing and finishing the parts that make up these large-scale models. The T80 is a fascinating subject, but it's pretty devoid of detail, and I wanted to make something to give it company on my shelves. It quickly became evident that the world of land speed cars was where I'd find my inspiration. In particular, the famous Bluebird cars of Sir Malcolm Campbell. Campbell became dominant in the world of land speed records in the 1920s and 30s, holding the record nine times. He became the first man to take a car to over 300 miles an hour, and the first man to hold the record on land and on water. Having begun his racing career with a series of derricks, Malcolm Campbell launched his quest for ultimate speed back in the 1920s, buying a 350 horsepower 18.3 litre Sunbeam V12 and naming it Bluebird. He unofficially set new records in the Sunbeam in 1922 and 1923, but it wasn't until streamlining was added that Campbell set his first record in 1924 at 146.16 miles an hour on Pendine Sands. Campbell realised he'd extracted everything from the Sunbeam and began work on an all-new car, powered by the 23-litre Napier Lion engine. This allowed him to retake the record in 1927. A year later and Bluebird was rebuilt again, this time with the Schneider Trophy engine. This helped Campbell push the record beyond the 200 mile an hour barrier. In the competitive world of land speed records, the bar was soon raised again and Campbell was forced to further upgrade Bluebird in 1929. But with the competition building faster and faster cars, Campbell again set about building an all new car, the Campbell Napier Railton Bluebird. He used this car to set two further speed records, ultimately reaching 251 miles an hour in 1932 and was knighted, becoming Sir Malcolm Campbell. In 1933, he radically rebuilt Bluebird into its final incarnation. It was powered by the Rolls-Royce Type R racing engine, which had been used in the dominant Schneider Trophy winning racing aircraft. The Type R would ultimately evolve into the Griffin, powering Spitfires in World War II. Taming the immense power of this engine took time, and it was not until 1935 that it could be fully harnessed. Initially, Campbell set a new record of 276.82 miles an hour on Daytona Beach. But it wasn't until he reached the salt flats of Bonneville that he pushed the record to 301.129 miles per hour. This was the pinnacle of Campbell's achievement, crowning his record-breaking career. This final incarnation resides today at the Motorsports Hall of Fame of America, at Daytona International Speedway, and this is the car I intend to recreate. I was fortunate enough to see this incredible car displayed at the Goodwood Festival of Speed back in 2004, and managed to get a few photos. It was about 40 feet up in the air at the time. Finding good source information on Bluebird has been difficult, but I do have some basic dimensions and discovered this range of books on the land speed cars. They're reprints of articles from the motoring press back in the day. While they don't have much in the way of technical information, they do tell the story well. There are plenty of photos and cutaways, so with a bit of detective work, I reckon I can make a good stab at Campbell's 1935 Bluebird. There may even be one or two other subjects that grab my attention. Based on known dimensions and photos, this is what I've managed to come up with in Coral Draw. I think it captures the spirit of Bluebird pretty well, and is a lot cheaper than an airline ticket with a tape measure. Using my 3D modelling software and what I've learned from the T80, this is what I've managed to design so far. This is just a basic 3D model without any internal structure, but it allows me to nail down the complex curves that make up Bluebird. The next stage is to break it down into component parts for 3D printing. The bodywork will be in four main parts, using the same joining technique as the T80, but with no separate chassis this time. This is because the wheels are external 
and uncovered. But the cockpit is open and this will have to be detailed and inserted from underneath the car. These large sections took days to 3D print. Unlike the T80, I decided to opt for automatic supports during the 3D printing. I figured it would give me a more reliable, better quality print at the cost of time and extra ABS. I always add a flat base to my parts, which increases the surface area in contact with the build plate. This prevents the part from becoming detached during 3D printing. And here you can see one of the main body parts being 3D printed. The front of the cockpit is at the bottom, and the bulges for the Rolls-Royce engine are at the top. The image quality is a bit rubbish, because I'm filming through a sheet of acrylic. The printer is kept in an enclosure, keeping the temperature stable, so that the ABS doesn't distort during printing. I made the wall thickness for these parts about 3mm, which is a bit overkill. On the good side, it is very rigid and strong, with no distortion. On the downside, the parts take forever to print and use up a lot of ABS. This is the actual speed of the printing with a 0.6mm nozzle. The quality is excellent and once it's up and running, I can just leave it until the print is finished. Fortunately, my Ultimaker is very reliable and I rarely get failures. The last thing you need is a print failure after 36 hours. And here are the parts, fresh from the printer. This is the nose section. You can clearly see the layer lines, especially at the front of the part. The next part carries the front axle. This has minimal support material and you can start to see just how thick I've made this section. This is the part we saw on the 3D printer, finally finished. Hopefully the support structure will be easy to remove. I orientated all the parts to minimise the need for supports, as I hate wasting material. And here's the last part, the tail section. You can clearly see just how good the printer is at recreating the complex curves of this part. The tip of the tail is a bit of a mess. This is due to the cross section getting smaller and smaller with the printer adding material onto layers that are still molten. I'll do a how-to video for 3D printing soon, so make sure you've subscribed to my channel to see it when it goes live. Of course, I also 3D printed the wheels and tyres. The tyres were also printed in ABS on my Ultimaker, but the wheels were printed on my higher resolution photocentric resin printer. Now, let's make a start on these parts and get some of this support cut off. Tin snips and pliers are my weapons of choice for this stage. It's quite good fun hacking off the supports, revealing the parts. Fortunately, there's nothing too delicate to worry about here, but I do have to be a bit careful when I get close to the edges. I can repair the parts, but I'd rather not damage them in the first place. The nose section has a lot of support material internally. Some of it will have to wait until I clean up the parts a bit more thoroughly. Next I'm on to the front axle section. Here there are supports near the front and filling the side pods. I have to break through the end plate and pull out the material with my pliers if I want to get it all out. That'll have to wait till another day, but that's okay. Now let's have a look at the front cockpit. Here the only support material is what you can see, so this should be fairly easy to clean up. The support lattice is very thin and breaks away easily, but it does leave a bit of a mess behind where it's in contact with the part. After a more thorough cleanup, I'll see exactly how much I have to fill and file up. There are always lots of decisions and compromises to be made when designing and 3D printing parts, but that's all part of the game when you're scratch building. Last but not least, let's tackle the tail section. In terms of supports, this is a mirror image of the previous part, but it also has internal supports which I can't get to. Normally I wouldn't be bothered about these, but some of them have broken loose and are rattling around inside. I don't have to tell you how annoying that is, so I'll probably cut a hole in the back of the cockpit and fish out the debris.
And that's the first stage of cleaning up complete, and we can start to get a rough idea of how Bluebird is going to look. With a little more tidying, the parts are starting to come together, and you can begin to see the clean lines of this beautiful speed machine from the 1930s. Of course, it's still a long way from being finished, but the main parts are now well underway. In the next episode, I'll get them cleaned up and fully assembled, with the wheels on. Then it will be on to the detailing. There's the open cockpit to tackle, as well as the exhausts, and some suspension detail at the front. Finally, I'll get it into paint, and it can sit next to the T-80. I hope you're enjoying Project Bluebird. If you are, hit the like button, and make sure you subscribe to my channel. So you catch my next video when it goes live, click on the bell icon. As you can see from my channel, I've always got lots of projects going on, which I hope you'll find interesting. These range from staples and vine models featured in Sarah's vlog, to short projects like this and the T-80. If you have any questions about Project Bluebird, just leave them in the comments and I'll get back to you. Thanks for watching.